How do you react when you face opposition for being a Christian? There's two ways uh, that you could react. There's lots of ways, but here's two ways. Uh, you could act, react aggressively or peacefully. You could react aggressively or peacefully. I'm going to give you a story. Kids, who plays soccer? Put your hand up if you play soccer here. You've got a few soccer players? Yeah. Okay. Righty I'm going to give you a story, and this is, uh, this is based on a true story. It's an example. And have a think about how you would react in this situation. Okay, you're playing soccer, you go to training, um, you're part of the team on Saturdays, you play, uh, you play every weekend when you can play on Saturdays. But sometimes there's games on Sundays. And you tell your coach, well, I, I won't be playing on Sunday because I'm going to church with my family. Okay? Now, the, after this happens a few times, the coach blows up. He said, this is not good enough. You need to be committed to the team. You know, we've all got things we could do on Sundays. We could go and, uh, you know, I'm sure all these other players could go and go fishing or whatever they want to do. I could do lots of other things with my Sundays, but we all give it, you know, give Sunday up for the team. It's good enough for us. It should be good enough for you. It doesn't matter that you think you, you know, that you want to go to church. You've got to be committed to the team. And if you're not willing to play on Sundays, then I don't want you to be part of the team. What do you, how do you react in that situation? How do you react when you face opposition for what you believe in, for standing up for your faith? How would you react, Beth, in that situation, do you think? It'd be tough, wouldn't it? It'd be hard to know. You could be aggressive, okay? You could be aggressive. You could say uh, you could start abusing the coach or you could complain about the coach to all your friends. You could start rumours about him, false rumours about him stealing money from the club. You could um, put it all over Facebook, you know, what he's done and, and try to get back at him and make people hate him. You could be aggressive in the way you react or you could act peacefully. You know, let him calm down a bit. Uh, think, of, you know, let him think about what uh, the issue is. Talk to him through it. Try to see things from his side. Discuss it. Are you going to react aggressively or peacefully. How do you face your enemies? I don't know if you watched the uh, Rugby League World Cup, but last weekend there were some very interesting things that happened in the game before the game even started between Samoa and Tonga. And in uh, New Zealand there'd been fights in the streets between the Samoans and the Tongans in the lead up to this game. And it was really interesting. How were the players going to react to what was happening outside the stadium? There was two interesting things that happened. The first one was, you'll see in the bottom picture, they all shook hands before the game, they hugged each other, they got in a big circle and they knelt down and they prayed. They reacted peacefully to what was going on outside the stadium. But then, you know, a couple of minutes later, they did their war cries, their huckers. And it made me think there's two different things happening here. There's peaceful and there's aggressive, isn't there? How, what, how were they going to react to what was happening, peacefully or aggressively? Well, Peter says some very important words about how we are to react in the face of opposition to our faith. If someone's opposed to you being a Christian, how do you react? And did you find the words there in those verses? I wonder if any of the kids can tell me what the first missing word is. Live in not heaven, that comes later. That's a good guess, though. It starts with H, doesn't it? Live in, can you see it in the, word, in the verse there? It's in verse 8. Verse 8. Live in harmony. Okay, now what's harmony? If you're a musician, you know, or if you're musically inclined, you know that when two notes are played that go together and sound good together, that's called harmony. And so it's sort of a unity, isn't it, where two things go together. And they work together to make a good sound. And so uh, it's talking about unity. Peter's saying live in unity with each other or harmony with each other. What's the next word? B, S. What starts with S? Do you have a guess? No, it's in those verses if you can see it. B, sympathetic. Very good. Okay, sympathetic. What does that mean? It means to be understanding. And show kindness to other people. What's the next word? To show brotherly love. 
uh, sort of love that brothers have for each other. Now, my brother and I weren't very good examples of brotherly love. I used to bowl bounces and try and hit him in the head all the time in cricket. But um, brotherly love, the sort of love that binds you together as a family, that's the sort of love that we've got to show others. Uh, next one, be com compassionate. Compassionate. What's compassion? That's where you uh, want to be caring and kind to others, isn't it? Next one, B starts with H. Sarah, do you say it? Humble. Uh, humble is when you put others before yourselves. Next one uh, is to uh, seek P. Starts with P. Seek peace, that's right. And now all of these things, you could act aggressively when you face opposition, couldn't you? But in all of these things, Peter says, no, you've got to act peacefully. You, it's very easy to repay people. And he says in verse 9, he says, he says, don't repay evil for evil or insult with insult, but repay the evil with a blessing. Blessing saying something good about someone. It's very easy to act aggressively. And Peter knows this because let me tell you about something that happened in Peter's life. Um, when uh, the night before Jesus died, and a big crowd of guys, uh, like a soldiers, came out to arrest Jesus. How did Peter react to that? Well, he grabbed his sword and he swung it around and he actually cut off a bloke's ear uh, because he wanted to fight for Jesus. And Jesus said, stop, that's enough. Put away your sword. We don't need that. So Peter remembers, when he's writing this letter, he remembers back to a time when he acted aggressively in the face of opposition. And he knows, but he also remembers something that Jesus said. Oh, there he is again. Uh, he also remembers something that Jesus said. Do you remember these words? Some of the most striking words in the Bible. Love your enemies and do good to them. Love your enemies? That doesn't make sense, does it? They're your enemies because you hate them or they hate you. How are you supposed to love your enemies? But Jesus taught that and he lived it out. He showed people. And Peter uh, shows us how we can love our enemies by being, living in harmony, by being sympathetic, by showing brotherly love, by being compassionate and humble, by giving a blessing and by acting in peace. Now you might say, why should I do this? Why should I do this? Look in verse 12 because there's two important truths in verse 12. In fact, we're going to read it together so that we get it. Look in verse 12 in chapter 3. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So you see the two reasons why we should love our enemies? Firstly, because you know that God's watching and God's, uh, God hears you and he, he, he looks at he sees you and he cares for you, and you can trust him to care for you. But the second truth, is that God will deal with your enemies. He'll deal with those who act you know, in that way towards you. You don't have to worry about them. You can love them because God's going to deal with them. Love your enemies. Don't look for revenge. Well, there's two ways, be it to be aggressive or to be peaceful in your reaction to others. But there is another way. Run away. Run away and hide. That's another option, isn't it? You can be aggressive or you can be peaceful. You can just be scared. You can be frightened and let that fear take over your life. Well, look at what um, Peter says uh, in verse 13, because if, you, uh, if you're a Christian, if you're living God's way, you don't have to worry about what other people think about you. Look at verse uh, 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord or revere Christ as Lord. See what Peter's saying? Don't be afraid of others if they threaten you. We don't need to be afraid of people's threats against us if they're opposed to our Christianity. In fact, uh, he says, uh, we've got to think about what Peter, the people Peter was talking to, okay? Remember what we said before? The people Peter was talking to, were their lives were threatened. They knew that they could, they could be executed for their faith. 
But Peter says, don't fear what they fear. Now, when he says don't fear what they fear, he's not talking about um, mice because I'm, people in my family say it's all right to be afraid of mice. He's not talking about being afraid of spiders or snakes or heights or needles or any of those sorts of things. Do you know that there's a, there's a phobia called, hang on, let me read it, omphalophobia. Omphalo, do you know what that is? Anyone have a guess? It's a fear of belly buttons. <laughs> now, don't ask me why anyone would have a fear of belly buttons, but there is a f genuine omphalophobia. If you have omphalophobia, I feel very sorry for you. It's a fear of be uh, belly buttons because you can't get away from yours, can you? So when Peter says, don't fear what they fear, he's not talking about phobias, being afraid of mice or snakes or anything. He's talking about being afraid of people who threaten your life. Why shouldn't we be afraid? Look in verse 15 there. He says in verse 15, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. We've got to remember that Jesus is Lord. He's in control and nothing happens without him. Think about Peter in this picture. This is Peter on the night before Jesus died. He's learned this lesson from experience. Because on the night before Jesus died, people came up to him and they said, you're one of Jesus' people, aren't you? You belong to him. You follow him. And Peter said, no, I don't even know the bloke. Three times they said to him, you belong to Jesus. You, you're his friend. Three times Peter said, I don't know him. And Peter was afraid. He knew what fear was that night. He knew what it was to be afraid of opposition to your faith. But then think about Peter a couple of months later. A couple of months later, Peter had been preaching boldly about the Lord Jesus in front of thousands of people. He no longer denied knowing Jesus. In fact, he wanted everyone to know who Jesus was. And Peter was arrested and they put him in the slammer for a night to cool him off. And then they brought him out. And they started to threaten him. They said, you're not to teach in the name of the Lord Jesus. You're not to teach about this man, not to teach anything to do with him. What did Peter say? Have a look at these words. What's right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to God? You decide. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. See, Peter's attitude had changed, hasn't it? When he was threatened before Jesus died, he gave in. He denied Jesus. But now he's bold and he stands up for Jesus. What had changed? What had changed for Peter? He'd seen Jesus die on the cross, but he'd seen Jesus alive again. And he knew that Jesus is the Lord of life and death. He knew that Jesus is Lord. As Peter says here, Set apart Jesus as Lord in your hearts. And he knew that Jesus was in control from Jesus' uh, uh, resurrection. And he prayed this prayer with his friends that night after he was arrested and, and set free. He said, Sovereign Lord, they said, uh, Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They killed your holy servant Jesus. Now, Lord, consider their threats and make your servants able to speak your word with great boldness. Peter wasn't afraid anymore, was he? In fact, when he faced threats, he wanted to speak even more about Jesus. I know I've seen a T-shirt that I think Peter might have worn. I saw this bloke wearing this T-shirt in Tamworth one time, and I thought, that bloke must be a Christian, because that's the sort of life we're meant to live, a life with no fear. Because we set apart Jesus as Lord. That'd be a good present. If you want to buy me a present for Christmas, I don't want a hundred of them, okay? <laughs> Just work it out. Everyone put in 10 cents or something. But I, wouldn't, I wouldn't mind a T-shirt like that, okay? Because that's the sort of T-shirt that we should be wearing as Christians. There's no fear because Jesus is Lord. Do you trust that Jesus is Lord? You've tasted that he's good. But have you accepted him in your heart as your Lord? Have you set him apart in your heart 
as your Lord. You know, in the, when the Bible talks about your heart, it talks about your decisions and your plans. That's where your decisions and your plans are made, in your heart, according to the Bible. So when it says, make Jesus the Lord of your heart, is he the Lord of your plans and the Lord of your decisions, the Lord of your life? Set apart Jesus as Lord, and you don't need to fear what anyone else will say about you being a Christian. Now, sometimes people get afraid of what their friends might say. If I go to church, my friends are going to give me a hard time. If I say that, if I tell people that I'm a Christian, people might reject me. They might exclude me. We don't have to fear that. There's no fear in living as a Christian because Jesus is Lord. He's in control. And what he thinks about us is more important than what other people might think. Lives of no fear. That's what God wants us to live. Okay, we're up to the last bit of Peter's advice for Christians who are facing uh, opposition for their faith. And the last bit is found in verses 15 to 18. So I'm going to read that to us, uh, back to verse 15. At the bottom of page 1829, right on the last sentence, it says, But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. See, first of all, just before we go any further, it's about sharing your hope, is it? You've got to share your hope. Yeah, right yeah. whatever. Okay, let's keep reading. Uh, verse 16, uh, end of verse 15. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It's better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive by the Spirit. See some really interesting words in that, isn't it? It says to share your hope but do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience. Ben, what's going on? Okay, kids, Ben's misunderstood. <laughs> he, he thought I said share your rope. What did I say? <laughs> Thanks, kids. Thanks, Pat. <laughs> One of the oldest kids here today. <laughs> share, not share your rope, Ben. It's share your hope, mate. Share your hope. <laughs> what does it mean to share your hope? Well, you know, give a, uh, look at verse uh, 15 there, you know. He says to give a reason for the hope that you have. In other words, we know that we've got great hope in God. We, we saw in chapter 1 a few weeks ago, didn't we, that God has got a great inheritance waiting for us. He's got a special thing prepared for us in heaven, and he's going to give us that, and he's going to keep us for that day. He's going to keep what's in heaven for us, and he's going to keep us for heaven. So that's the hope that we have been. Well, yeah, you've got to be, it says, what does it say? It says in verse 15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. So you've always got to be prepared. It doesn't matter, you know, any time. It could, it, opportunities to speak about Jesus could come up at any moment. And sometimes we miss those opportunities. I miss them all the time. <laughs> miss the opportunities to speak about Jesus to my friends. But we've got to be prepared to give that reason for the hope. All right. What if they don't listen to you? Well, that doesn't really matter, does it? Like, you've just got to be able to share it, but share it in the right way. Make sure, look at what it says there in verse uh, 16. Keep it clear, uh, sorry, end of verse 15. Do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour may be ashamed of their slander. So you've got to be ready to do it. Even if they don't listen to you, just do it gently and respectfully. And respect, if they've got different opinions, you've got to respect that. But just help them to see the hope that you have in your heart. 
All right. How many questions are you? You got any more questions? Just let me know now. And we've got to get on with this. We're you know, taking time. All right, okay, why? Why? Well, let's have a look at verse 18 to find out the why, Ben. All right, in verse 18, it says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. There's no better uh, reason than that because all our hope is in Jesus. It says Christ died for sins. He didn't die for his own sin. He died for our sins. I was talking with this about Sam and Holly a few weeks ago, and I don't know if they, they probably remember this, but imagine this book is not a Bible, but it's a list, well, it's a record of all my sin, okay? And a list of all the things I've done, the things I haven't done that I should have done, the things I've thought, the things that I've, you know, I shouldn't have thought, all those sorts of things. This Bible is a record, this book is a record of my sins. And when Jesus died, he didn't have any sin because he followed God's will perfectly. But what Jesus did is he died for my sin and he took my sin away so that I don't have to be judged for my sin anymore. God gives me free forgiveness and a free relationship with him. Jesus, it says, verse 18, Christ died for sins. He died once for all. We don't need to keep making sacrifices. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. Nothing we have we can give to God. Only our faith in the Lord Jesus. Uh, Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. He was our substitute. We deserve to die that death for sin, but he died in our place. He's our substitute. And the last bit, he died to bring you to God because without Jesus, we're lost from God. And we need Jesus to bring us back, to restore us, to reunite us with God. See, Ben, the reason you share your rope I uh, share your hope, sorry. The reason you share your hope is because all our hope is in Jesus. And that's a great message we have to share with a world that has no hope. When you look around our world, not a lot of hope is there. We've got a great message to share. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you uh, that you uh, promise when we face opposition that we don't need to fear uh, because we know that Jesus is Lord, that he's in control. Father, I pray that you would help us to love our enemies, as Jesus said, to do good to those who do wrong to us, to do uh, to good to those who persecute us. Lord, when we face opposition, I pray that you would help us to be ready to share the hope that we have because all our hope is in the Lord Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen.